one month, so I hope to have some uh, discussions with many of you while I am here. Please uh, feel free to, to come and see me anytime. Uh, all right, so I think this is supposed to be more of a gr graduate mini course than uh, a seminar talk. So my plan is to give uh, maybe some details of some things. Uh, maybe not every detail of everything, but some details of, of some things. And also even to give a few uh, exercises. So for the, to keep the students busy, I will mention, mention some exercises as we go along. Okay, oh, and of course, you should ask me questions. So more of a mini course than a seminar talk. So you should ask lots of questions. Maybe I can answer some of them. Okay, the topic in general of, the, of all the lectures is nonlinear Schrodinger equations of various types. Many of you are somewhat or, or very familiar with nonlinear Schrodinger equations. And so I don't have to give a big justification as to why we should spend lots of time studying nonlinear Schrodinger equations. But just to mention uh, very briefly, of course, nonlinear Schrodinger type equations come up in many places in uh, physics, all kinds of applications. Uh, just to mention a few quantum mechanics especially many body quantum theory. Uh, optics is a famous one where nonlinear Schrodinger play, uh, plays a role. Uh, one that's maybe slightly less well known, but by the end of today will be much better known, is ferromagnetism. And uh, one can go on, the superfluids, So there's no shortage of uh, physics reasons to study nonlinear Schrodinger type equations. But somehow mathematically, one thing we always have in mind when we're looking at uh, equations like this is that we're trying to understand phenomena. So we want to understand something about the general phenomena of dispersive but nonlinear waves, then nonlinear Schrodinger equations are a natural a laboratory for this. So you might say as a, as a model for nonlinear dispersive waves more generally. So we can understand mathematically what's, what's going on. Okay, I'll, of course I'll write some equations as we go. Uh, The themes that I'll be emphasizing in these lectures are the following. We will have the, well, generally speaking, the theme is to try to understand global behavior of solutions as much as possible. Uh, so I consider the initial value problem for some nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Can we describe what's happening to the corresponding solution? for a large class of initial data. That's the, the goal. More precisely, uh, we'll look at solitons and their stability, so stability of solitons. So solitons, in general, I just mean the basic, usually stationary solution of the equation, whether it's a soliton or something else which physically you would think of as the, the kind of ground state, the basic solution. And so at first you want to understand how solutions behave in a neighborhood of these ground states, let's call them solitons. That's, that's the theory of stability of solitons. More generally, we're interested in long time dynamics. That's of course related to solitons because if the solitons are the are the ground states, then somehow you should be able to describe the long time dynamics in terms of these ground states. 
And then also related to long time dynamics is the question of whether long time dynamics exist or not. So that's the question of whether you have flow up or singularity formation. Singularity formation or sometimes non formation. So these are the things I'll talk about for all of the lectures. More precisely, uh, the topics will go roughly like this. There are three of them that I want to touch on, at least three, probably only three. First one is what you might call a geometric nonlinear Schrodinger equation, or which in physics you would call the Landau Lifshitz equation. One topic, and that's uh, that's today's topic. So, roughly speaking, this will be maybe lectures one and two. Second topic will be nonlinear Schrodinger equation with potential. Okay, so potential introduces some kind of external force, and the question is, how do, let's say, solitons of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation interact with the potential of the external force? Roughly speaking, that's the next lectures. And then the last topic, it's a little bit different than the first two, has to do with periodic, spatially periodic solutions of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, periodic ways. speaking, the last lecture. Of course, this may change dramatically as we go, but we'll see. That's the, that's the plan. OK. So then let me jump right into today's topic. which is this so-called geometric nonlinear Schrodinger equation. More precisely, it goes by two different names. It's uh, sometimes called Schrodinger map. And as I wrote before, it's sometimes called Landau Lifshitz. Let's start with some preliminaries where we discuss the, the setting, the geometry, and so on for this problem. So it'll be a little while before I can actually write the equation, but we'll get there. So let's begin with considering maps between manifolds. Uh, so I want to think of time-dependent family of maps from one manifold, which is going to be actually always R2, into another manifold, well, almost always R2, into another manifold, which is going to be always S2. Uh, more generally, the entire discussion I'm going to, to give here could be generalized to some other Riemannian manifold as the domain. And some other Kähler manifold, so a manifold with a complex structure, as the target. And I'm just going to stick to this case. Moreover, even though in, in ge geometric problems, 
somehow you, you really want to try to describe things uh, intrinsically without referring to embedding, but it turns out to be much more practical to consider this, uh, the, the extrinsic point of view. Put this S2 inside of R3 and just think about unit vectors. So that means I have a unit vector in R3 always. So I have this unit length constraint. Okay, I should put a picture somewhere. Let's put the picture maybe, okay, put the picture here. So here's S2 sitting in R3. The next thing I want to do is I want to assign an energy to this map. Very simple. I just take the Dirichlet energy. And then I want to differentiate this functional. So I want to compute variational derivative of this energy functional. Of course, everyone knows how to compute the variational derivative of the uh, Dirichlet fun functional. But we have to do it properly, keeping in mind that our map is taking values in the sphere. So we have a constraint. Here is, say, U, point on the sphere. And so if I want to compute, this is for the graduate student, if I want to compute this variational derivative uh, properly, I have to remember this constraint. In other words, I should think about taking a family of maps. depending on some parameter epsilon, which is a variation of some given map u. And then if I differentiate with respect to epsilon, I get a vector, but of course not just any vector, I get a tangent vector. So this is a vector which lies in the tangent space of the sphere. like this. And of course, this picture is so simple. For any given vector u, tangent plane is just the orthogonal complement of u. Okay, so I take a variation like this, compute the variational derivative, I should put one parameter variation inside my energy functional and then differentiate with respect to the parameter. Plug into the Dirichlet energy. And of course, you get this. Some over repeated indices, of course, over j equals 1 and 2. And now we just have to do a tiny bit of geometry. We have to remember that c is a, a tangent vector. And we should avoid differentiating tangent vectors in the usual way. We should always differentiate tangent vectors covariantly. So in other words, another way to say that, since u is a unit vector, so u is a unit vector, when I take any kind of derivative of u, that's tangent. So that means that any derivative of u is in the tangent space. So this is in the tangent space. 
but this is not necessarily. And so what I should do is instead of considering this guy, I should project it back into the sense system. So I have a projection. Let's call it, let, let me write it as P U, which is just the usual orthogonal projection onto the tangent space. And I have this operation of covariant differentiation, where if I have a, a tangent vector field, I define the covariant derivative of that tangent vector field to be the usual derivative projected back onto the tangent space. And it's easy to work out that this is given by this formula here. So that's how we differentiate covariant. All right, so this is tangent. Is not, so I can project it onto the tangent space without changing the value, so then I get a covariant derivative here. Same thing. And now I can do my integration by parts over the covariant derivative, which is anti self adjoint to the other side. Now I see what my variational derivative is. It's just one. Right? So taking into account the geometry, the variational derivative of the Dirichlet functional is this guy of Laplacian, but it's Laplacian projected back into the tangent space. And it's simple to work out what that is for the sphere. You get the, here's your Laplacian, and here's the correction. So that's the variational derivative of the Dirichlet energy for maps into the sphere. And of course, it's not linear anymore. It's nonlinear. And so this is where all the nonlinearity comes from in all of the problems I'm going to describe today. It comes from the fact that the target manifolds use curves rather than plus. As I said before, please stop me at any time if you have other questions. I'd be happy to try to answer them. Okay, maybe I can do this. All right, so that's just energy, that's statics. And now we can finally talk about dynamics. There's a bunch of natural dynamical equations you, should, you can associate to this energy. Uh, the simplest maybe would be the heat flow, very classical equation. Harmonic map heat flow. HF for heat flow, some kind of nonlinear uh, version of the heat equation, nonlinear parabolic equation. So there's heat, there's wave, it's called the wave map equation. It's been very well studied in recent years. So the wave map, well, I want to make it wave, so I have to take two time derivatives. So I should differentiate here, but I should do so covariantly. So write it this way. It works out to the following.
that's the wave map. I'm not going to say much, too much about either of these. What I really want, I'm interested in is the Schrodinger version. write down the Schrodinger version, I just write down what I think the Schrodinger equation should be, which I mean, means I need an i. I need a, um, a multiplication by i, which is, uh, if you think about it, a multiplication by i is just a, a 90 degree rotation. So that's what we need to do on this manifold. We need a 90 degree rotation, also known as a complex structure. I need to take, I need an oper operation which takes this tangent vector here and rotates it by 90 degrees in the tangent space. I'm going to call that J, the operation J. So J U maps the tangent space to itself. vector to, well, think about how you do a 90 degree rotation. It would just be taking the crush product here, vector u, u cross. So that's the complex structure on the sphere. It's very simple. Once I have that, I can write down a, a Schrodinger type equation. I put the j here and the variation derivative. I think I want a minus. Doesn't really matter. Which gives me u cross u cross this this guy here. But of course, when I take u, if I'm not worried about writing a tangent vector, this will get killed. That equation there is called the Schrodinger map equation. It has some, well, what it looks like is just some general Hamiltonian, has some superficial resemblance to this, formal resemblance to the Schrodinger equation here. But when you write it in this form, it's not remotely clear that it's a Schrodinger type equation. We'll see later that it's very much a Schrodinger type equation. So this is my main object of study here today. One other thing you can do, it's slightly more general, is to write down an equation which is a combination of the Schrodinger and the heat, or if you like, it's the Schrodinger map with some dissipation given by the heat flow. This is uh, very common in the physics literature, and so even though Strictly speaking, this is the landau lipschitz equation. Uh, this is called the landau lipschitz equation. What really tends to appear in the physics literature has, has the damping in it. So that would be something like this. This is the Schrodinger fire. And let's add. for a dissipation. So I'm going to call that equation LL for Landau Lipschitz. Which equation, I'm sorry? Yes? This one. It looks that way. But you shouldn't take this too seriously. So I'll show you, uh, I'll show you later how we look at this equation, and you'll see how it really looks. In some ways, 
it's more like cubic NLS. We'll see. This is very misleading. It looks, it looks terrible when you look at it this way. Okay, so just before we proceed with analysis, just one, one word about why, why we might bother studying equations like this. And as I said before, there, there's a physical reason. So in physics, more precisely, ferromagnetism, uh, there's some theory called micromagnetic, sometimes called micromagnetic, which is a continuum description of a ferromagnet. In this, uh, in this theory, this vector u is called the magnetization vector. which is supposed to describe uh, locally at different places in your ferromagnet which direction the spins are aligned in. That's it. Fer fer ferromagnets, uh, they, they develop regions where all the spins are aligned in some direction. This vector is recording now the direction in each location in space. And then what the Schrodinger map equation is saying, which, which is written down actually by Landau and Lipschitz in the 30s, I guess it was. Schrodinger map says that the magnetization vector undergoes uh, precession in some effective magnetic field. Which is given by the Laplace. That's a very superficial and vague way of describing the physical origin of this equation. If you want to do something slightly more precise, think about having a collection of classical spins, so unit vectors, on a lattice. And each of these spins is going to undergo precession in an effective magnetic field. And the effective magnetic field is given by the average of the neighboring spins on the lattice. And then you pass to a continuum limit. The average becomes the Laplace. That's a slightly more precise way of thinking about where this equation comes from. And I just, I, I, I would like to say that this equation uh, on, genuinely appears in many places in the physics literature. It's, it's a, a really, widely used model for ferromagnets. And so I would argue that this uh, Schrodinger map equation is every bit as physically important as, say, the wave map, which has generated much more mathematical literature so far. I understand the wave map has, well, the wave map was originally sort of a toy model in particle physics. But it does have some connections to general relativity. But I would argue that in terms of being an honest to goodness physical model, the Schrodinger map or Landau Lipschitz is just as good. With the one uh, caveat that in the physics literature, you would usually see this equation with a slightly more complicated energy functional. So you have this, this isotropic called the exchange energy, this averaging of the neighbor's energy. And then there would typically be other terms as well anisotropy external fields, and some other terms. But this is still the basic model. So I think we're justified in studying this equation every bit as much as uh, studying the wave map equation. Please. Um, what is the difference between the Schrodinger map and the Landau Lipschitz uh, wave function? I, is there a, a, a difference between these two? Very big difference. So here I put in, I put in some uh, dissipation. So this now, this is a purely conservative equation. It's a wave equation, basically. This is a parabolic equation. This one, I haven't said it yet. I'll say it in a moment. This one conserves energy. This one dissipates energy. 
So mathematically, analytically, there's a huge difference between these two, right? Uh, although they have similar behavior in many respects. They have the same, same scaling, for example. So one, one can actually learn a lot about what might happen for the Schrodinger case by looking at the Landau Lipschitz case, or even the heat flow. In fact, it's not a bad way to predict phenomena. But mathematically, one is parabolic and one is hyperbolic. They're quite different. Okay. Uh, so this is projection. So, so I'm projecting this vector back into the tangent space. So I'm subtracting this dot u times u. But uh, yeah, this this is subtracting the, the normal component. Uh, you want to put derivative here? I, I switched it. So, so uh, originally you have a, mi a minus sign. Originally you have a minus sign and the derivative on this guy. But because C is perpendicular to U, I switched them as the cost of a minus. Sign. It's the same. It's the same as uh, it's the same as this. These are equal. Because c dot u equals zero. Uh -huh. Because this is perpendicular to u. Oh. Oh, okay. Thank you. Glad you're paying attention. All right, so our task for today is to understand something about the dynamics of this strange looking PDE. Uh, probably the very first thing you should observe. Uh, well, there's two, two things we should observe first. Let's say, yeah, okay. Uh, okay, conservation law. So, Schrodinger math equation, at least formally, conserves the energy. That's easy to see because, because of its Hamiltonian form. So if I take a solution, differentiate the energy, that's what I'll get. I get. I'll get E prime. And this product, oh, I should put my arrows on. And if I use the equation, expression, and since j is a 90 degree rotation, these two vectors have to be orthogonal. Energy conservation follows from the Hamiltonian form of the equation. And if I put in Dissipation, then the energy dissipates. The lambda lifts the heat flow, dissipate the energy. So that's one of the obvious differences between these two equations. Scaling. Scaling is always important. How does this equation scale? Well, if I scale x by s and t by s squared, that preserves the Schrodinger math equation. 
also the heat flow and the land are lifted. If you want to do the wave, you have to put balance scaling on x and t, of course. But also, also the energy. Because I'm in dimension two. So every, everything here is, is for dimension two. And this is the reason everything is for dimension two. Because that's the dimension where the energy is invariant under the scaling of the equation. So that means these problems are so-called energy critical. Anyone with experience in this business knows that the critical scaling problems have interesting features and typically lie somehow on the borderline between different kinds of behavior. In this case, on the borderline between glow up and global exudance. These problems are energy critical. Item of business, since we want to describe dynamics, the first thing you should look for are static solutions, time independent solutions. These are called harmonic maps. And in fact, in two dimensions like this, uh, the harmonic maps are complete, the static solutions are completely understood. Static solutions are critical points of the energy. Also known as harmonic maps. And now I want to show you a little, a little trick which shows why we understand the harmonic maps completely in two dimensions. Let's look at this energy again. There it is, just the gradient squared. I'm going to rewrite it in the following way. I'm not finished yet. Okay, if I expand this uh, square, I'll get the d1 squared. J is a rotation, it's an isometry, so I'll get the d2 squared. So that's, that's the energy. And then I'll get a cross term. So I have to cancel out the cross term. Now let me give you a exercise. Here's the exercise. It has two parts. The first part uh, involves this quantity. So the first part is to show that this quantity Not sure about the sign, so I'll put an absolute value to be safe. Is exactly the degree of the map. So if you don't know what I mean by degree, informally the degree is the number of times that the map covers the target, covers the sphere. You have to take into account the orientation, the way in which it covers. So a more precise definition of the degree is to take the volume form on the target sphere, pull it back by the map so that you're on R2, 
and then integrate the pullback. That will give you an integer. Well, up to up to a volume factor, it will give you an integer, and that's the degree of finesse. And so the, the exercise is to show that this quantity here is exactly to assign the degree. What that shows us in particular, since this quantity here is manifestly non-negative, that tells us that the energy has a bound from below by this quantity. So that if my map is topologically non-trivial, in the sense of having a non-zero degree, then it can't have small energy. Energy is bounded from below by the topology. The second part of the exercise is to figure out when this inequality is saturated. In other words, when this quantity is zero. This, uh, this PDE here, I claim, if you were to do a, a stereographic projection okay, so the stereographic projection is when you take the sphere, you sit it on the complex plane, and then you project all the points onto the complex plane. So then after stereographic projection, I can think of a map from R2 to C, or from C to C. So what, what would this equation be on the, as a map from complex plane to complex plane? It could only be the cauchy riemann space. So this is cauchy riemann Depending on the sign, it's for uh, holomorphic or anti-holomorphic, or I guess Maybe we should say meromorphic. So for uh, meromorphic or anti meromorphic. Okay. So there's no mystery about what the harmonic maps in this problem are. They're static solutions because they're just uh, pullbacks under the stereographic projection of meromorphic or anti meromorphic. Can essentially say explicitly what what they all are. But the, for us, the, the most interesting thing is this bound from below on the the, the energy. Okay, now so we have some static solutions. We want to study the dynamics. We want to study the Cauchy problem. all these equations, but in particular for Schrodinger map. So that's this, this thing here. With some initial condition. Where do we take the initial condition? Well, at the very least, everything I say here, I want to have finite energy. At the very least, finite energy. So another way of saying finite energy is the space h1 dot, since the energy is just the integral of the gradient squared. <coughs> and then usually when you're faced with a Cauchy problem, an initial value problem, you first ask if you have any kind of local welter, a solution locally in time, and then you ask about global welter. So already when you look at this, uh, this problem, It's still somehow lacking the optimal local well posedness theory. I mean, there, there are many results about local well posedness. In fact, going back quite a long time, so there's a paper in 
Sulem, Sulem, and Bardos, sort of ahead of its time in the 80s, which proves some local well posedness result for this equation. When you take initial data, uh, now you have to be careful. Remember that our our functions, they're not functions, really, they're maps. They take values in, a, not in a linear space, they're taking values in a manifold. So what we're going to do is we're going to subtract off some point on the sphere. So I'm taking, I'm taking arbitrarily choosing the North Pole. So here's, here's the North Pole. That's just the unit vector k. So if, after subtracting point the value at infinity, if you like. You have something in some sufficiently large Sobolev space. And at least locally in time, you have a solution to this equation. And this is, this is certainly far from optimal in the sense of uh, regularity. And there, there are a number of results for this equation and related equations. Uh, for example, This one from 07, which lower, which lower the regularity to say something like H3, which is still uh, pretty regular. And the point here maybe is that it seems like there is still no uh, good in general, result for energy space initial data. There's no general, I mean general without symmetry assumptions, which I'm going to make shortly. No general uh, local well positiveness result in the energy space that I know of. Energy, I, I mean H1 dot, the energy space which is sort of discouraging because whenever you have a, a scaling critical, like an energy critical problem, first thing you'd like to have is a good initial data, uh, a good local well posedness theory in the critical scaling space, which we just don't have. Although people are working on this, so there's some, uh, some at least r related results in uh, some recent papers. Smith and Dodson. But for now, no good local well positiveness theory in the energy space. What's a bit better is the small data theory. So there is a good small data theory. This is small data, small data in the energy space. So small energy, global well posedness. It's proved by Bejinari Vianeski Kenig and Kotaru. In, I'm not sure, maybe uh, 2011. So more precisely, if you take initial data, which is, well, we still, we still require it to have some, if you like, spatial decay. But smallness in the energy space, then there's a unique global solution. So 
this, if you're familiar with this business, it might look slightly strange that you have a good, reasonably good, small data theory, but not really a good local in time theory. In many situations, the small energy theory is somehow a natural outgrowth of the local in time theory when you have a scaling critical problem. But at least superficially, you can get an idea of why small data might be easier than even than local well posedness because when you have small energy then you have no topology if you have topology the energy can't be small so this is automatically this is automatically a topologically trivial situation whereas if you want to build a good local well posedness theory you have to allow for topologically non-trivial maps. And so there's no way you could have sort of sm smooth connection between the small data and the local well posed in this theory because this would be like the topologically uh, disconnected initial data. The initial data here and the initial data here can't be, uh, can't be connected smoothly. Okay. The Schrodinger map problem is an energy critical problem. And you have global well posedness if the energy is very small. And so you can guess what is the next question. Okay, what if I raise the energy? Do I get global well posedness for higher energies and how high? And if you think about it a little bit more, you think, well, okay, I should say, I should say something else. A unique global solution, but it also scatters. In some sense that I don't want to make precise here. So it, it goes to zero at time infinity. So if you think about what solutions we know that don't go to zero, well, those are the harmonic maps. So the only, at this point, the only obstacles we know of for this kind of global behavior with, uh, with scattering are these non-scattering solutions to the harmonic maps. So you would expect that the, the non-trivial harmonic maps of lowest energy would pr provide the natural energy threshold for global well. So that's an open problem. As far as I know, still an open problem. People are working on it, of course, but it's open. And I suppose it's quite hard. So the lowest, uh, oh, I put two here. I think it's actually four. Sorry. So the lowest harmonic map uh, energy is four pi. That's, a, as far as I know, a major open problem. I should remark that this, uh, this situation is, uh, is much better for the other equations I wrote up there. So this is, uh, so note, uh, this is known. That is, global well posedness below this energy threshold is known. Well, it's known classically for the heat flow, going back to work of Struve in the 80s. And it's even known for the wave map. These are more, somewhat more recent work of uh, Sturbins and Carter. the work of Krieger and Schlag. So 
that, that was a major problem in wave maps that was solved relatively recently. But it's still open for sure. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So this is hard. Understand the dynamics in, in general below the threshold is hard. And so we're going to look at easier problems. So what we're going to do, instead of considering general solutions, we're going to restrict to some symmetry classes where the equation is easier to understand. So there's a natural symmetry class for these uh, maps, and that's the equivariant maps. Right, so I'm going to call a map M equivariant if it has the following form. So now I'm going to work in polar coordinates, so R and theta are usual polar coordinates. m is an integer, and without loss of generality, I can take it to be a positive integer. m equals 0 would be the radially symmetric case, which I'm going to exclude from this discussion for now, but come back to later. So I take positive integers. And this r is the generator of rotation around, around the axis of the, the sphere. So this guy. Okay, so I think it's it's clear what, what the symmetry is here. This means that if you do rotations on the domain, that's doing rotations on the target. One rotation on the domain is m rotations on the target. And this is what's meant, what I mean by equivariant. So now let's look at the energy of an equivariant map. And we can express everything now in terms of this uh, profile function v, which depends only on the radial variable. So let me write this as. Uh, do, do the theta integration, and what's left, let me call that E of V. And E of V is this expression here. variant map. Now what I want to do in the equivariant setting is I want to do a more precise version of this integration by parts here. To understand the relationship between the energy and the topology of the map. So let's just look at this uh, energy density. factor it in the same way as I did before. Okay, so here in the notation, I'm, I'm not going to bother putting the superscripts here anymore. Everything will be with respect to the map V. So the rotation be with respect to V, projection will be with respect to V, and so on. I'm not going to write it. All right, so if I expand this square, I get this term. Let me put in the 1 half also. Since J is an isometry, I get this, oops, no, 
I don't. But now I do. Square of this guy is this guy, and then I get the cross term. Okay. Here's a little exercise, very small exercise. This uh, expression here, JRV, is the same as rejection of the unit vector k onto the tangent space. tangent space with respect to the map V now. Okay, and then once you have this part of the exercise, you can figure out what this is. It's just, what is it? It's uh, minus two, three, sub r. Oh, and by the way, this notation, V3, that just means third component. So I'm expressing my vector in component. Okay, uh, easy exercise. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to integrate the energy density in this form. So let's uh, integrate but not over the whole range. Let's integrate from A to B, let's say, with respect to R dr. And so I find that the energy contained on that interval, so I mean, I think it's clear what I mean by this notation. I mean, integrate the energy density from A to B. And then this term here, well, I get my derivative of V3, and that gets, uh, and then I have a 1 over R, but it gets canceled by the R here, and so I have perfect derivative. So I get what? Plus M V3, 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 B minus V3. Oh, plus or minus. Maybe it's minus plus. Let's go with minus plus. All right, and so again, this, this quantity here is manifestly a non-negative quantity, so I get a bound from below by the jump in V3 between those two points. any kind of transition uh, from one level on the sphere to another level on the sphere will cost me at least, in terms of energy, will cost me at least this much energy. And we get equality in this inequality exactly when this quantity inside here is equal to zero, which we know has something to do with the Cauchy-Riemann equation. More precisely now, it's just a simple ODE, which we can solve explicitly. Maybe that's the next exercise. Yeah, let's have another exercise. Two-part exercise. 
first is to show the finite energy maps that this profile function has certain properties. In particular, it's continuous. And moreover, has limits at zero and infinity. Once you know it's continuous with limits, you can go back and look at the expression for the energy and realize that what's being picked out here is the first two components, V1 and V2. And so these, for finite energy, these are going to have to go to zero. So the only possible limits are the north pole or the south pole. Okay. So this is a very uh, special property of equivariant maps, which fails in general, and it fails even in the radially symmetric case, that you somehow get pointwise control over the function, just in terms of the energy. And it's not enough, as, as, as you know well, it's not enough just to have this guy. This will not control the L-infinity norm. But the combination is enough to control L-infinity. So you have pointwise, this uh, uniform control on functions in the equivariant setting. It makes the analysis much easier. In particular, Without loss of generality, we can assume, let's choose the boundary condition at infinity to be the North Pole. So let's assume that V at spatial infinity is the North Pole. So my situation is like this. I look at, say, the third component of the map. I have something which is going to 1 at infinity, and then it's doing something else. And then at the origin, it has, uh, at the origin it has to go either here or here, two possibilities. Second part of the exercise is to solve this ODE system and find the functions, and we know they're going to be correspond to harmonic maps, the maps which saturate this inequality. So let's solve. Uh, I guess we know now that we've chosen the boundary condition here, we can choose the correct sign here. So I guess we choose the minus sign. And so uh, let's solve some ODEs. job is to show that the solutions are of this form. For some, some phase alpha, and some scaling. Remember, the whole problem is scale invariant, so we expect to see scaling here. some length scale s, where this is an explicit harmonic map profile. Here are the formulas. in solving this system of ODE. So these are the harmonic maps. They come in 
in, in the equivariant setting, these are the harmonic maps. They come in a two parameter phase parameter and scaling parameter. And what they look like is this. You can see from this inequality that they are the most efficient way to go from point to point, from level to level on the sphere. In particular, the most efficient way to go from South Pole to the North Pole in terms of the energy. So here's one, here's another, this is one at one length scale, here's one at another length scale. Plus minus. Sorry, is is it this expression here that you're worried about? I, di I didn't write it clearly enough, probably. But I'm not sure. Plus or minus over R J R V. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, um, I'm being deliberately lazy. So when it, okay, you're right, it's this you're worried about, right? Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I didn't write that, but that's there, yes, thank you. The other questions? Okay. All right, so now you can see from this picture that there are two possible different topological scenarios to consider. There's the topologically trivial one. map has its boundary condition at the origin is the same as its boundary condition at infinity. Something like this. And here there is no, there's no restriction, there's no topological restriction for the solution becoming constant at time infinity. So it's at least possible in this picture for the long time dynamics to be approaching a constant. So the natural uh, conjecture here is that if the energy is not too big, uh, now let's, let's think about for a second how big the energy should be. If we believe that the only possible obstacle to global existence and you could call it scattering, if you want scattering to a constant, is the presence of these harmonic maps. And if in this scenario you want to create a harmonic map, well, you have to go all the way over the sphere from top to bottom. That will cost you, uh, that will cost you 2m energy. And then because of the boundary condition, you have to come back. So if you take energy which is below that, twice the harmonic map energy, then a natural conjecture is that the solution, you have, you have global opposedness and scattering to zero. Not to zero, I'm sorry, to constant map where you get to the North Pole. 
scattering to uh, constant Trivial harmonic scattering. As far as I know, this is still an open problem. There's partial result, which I'll explain a bit later. Uh, the other scenario is the topologically non-trivial one. Where now the boundary conditions are connecting the North Pole to the South Pole. And now it's clear just uh, topologically that you cannot converge to a constant map anymore. Uh, and moreover, it's clear from this inequality that the energy can never be small. In fact, the energy is bounded from below by this jump times m. So the energy now is bounded from below by the harmonic map energy. And the question is, what happens? also an open question. Uh, but again, there is some partial progress, which I will discuss a bit later. So this is really, um, this is two kinds of problems. This is uh, below the threshold, and this is above the threshold. Now let me tell you the, the program for the rest of the le lectures today. So I'm going to discuss some results on these problems. In the following order, first below the threshold, second, Above, but only slightly above, slightly above. And then at the end, it transmits well above. Threshold here is given by the smallest energy harmonic map that fits in the boundary condition. In this case, it's uh, twice the energy, twice the harmonic energy. In this case, it's just one times the harmonic energy. Now, now is a good time to ask questions if you have any. Other times are also good times to ask questions. Right. So let's talk about the below threshold. As I said before, this is the general, the general below threshold problem where you have no symmetry restriction. And it's still open as far as I know. 
And then there's the corresponding below threshold problem in the equivariant setting. Uh, notice that the two problems are a little bit different because the, the energy thresholds are different. This is this is the harmonic map energy, whereas this is twice the harmonic map energy. That's because of the boundary you have in the equivariant state. You don't have any corresponding thing in the general. All right, so let's consider just the equivariant setting, but even maybe simpler than the equivariant setting is purely radially symmetric. So let's start with discussion of uh, radially symmetric solutions. That means I want to solve the following problem. So I have a function now, a map, depends only on R and P. And I want to solve Schrodinger map equation, which in the radial setting I can write this way. just covariant Laplacian in radial symmetry. And then I have an initial data uh, which is at least in the energy space. As a function on R2. So that's the radially symmetric Cauchy problem for the Schrodinger map case. All right, I said it's below threshold. So what, what's the threshold here? This, there is no threshold because there are no non-trivial radially symmetric harmonic maps. So the threshold energy is infinity. So there is no non-trivial radially symmetric harmonic map. So there's no threshold. There's no reason not to expect global well-posedness uh, and some kind of scattering for all energies. Okay, and that's what I claim happens. Let me state you a uh, theorem. student a few years ago. Uh, so let's take initial condition for this problem, which is in some space which is appropriate for existing local well-posedness theory. So something like this will do. Or maybe H two. I'm not sure. Let's let's say H three to be on the safe side. That's certainly not optimal, but the point is that you get global well posedness Lives in the same lives in the same class for all time, and moreover, you get some kind of scattering. Uh, I can't at this point. I can't exactly say what the nature of the scattering is. I'll mention that later. But at least you have some global space-time bounds on the solution, like the following.
Okay. What I'd like to do before we take a break is to give just a, a sketch of how this theorem is proved because at least it gives you some flavor of how, how you can analyze geometric equations like this in a very simple setting, simple setting of radial symmetry. Okay, so let's do a, a sketch. Okay. So the way this proof begins is important because it's the way all proofs for geometric equations begin. And that's uh, with orthonormal frames. So we need to express the map in some nice way. Because after all, if it's a map, it doesn't even lie in a linear space. It lies in a manifold. And we much prefer to work with linear spaces. Of course, you could try, if you want, you could try to put a coordinate system on the manifold, on the, the sphere. That might be okay if your map did not cover the entire sphere. But if your map covers the entire sphere, then your coordinate system is going to go bad somewhere. So that's not such a great idea in general. Instead, what people do is they take derivatives. So you take a derivative of a map. Remember from before, when you take a derivative, it lies in the tangent space. Tangent space is a linear space, at least. But of course, it changes. The tangent space changes as you move over the manifold. So what you want to do is you want to pick some orthonormal frame on all the tangent spaces and express derivatives of the solution of the map in this orthonormal frame, and then you have a usual function. The coordinates will be a usual function, and you can do usual analysis. So we're going to do some orthonormal frames in this very simple setting of radial symmetry. So here's what we do. We choose a unit vector, which will depend on depends on the map, so it depends on space and time, which is in the tangent space to the map, to the sphere at the map. Okay, unit. Just choose one such, okay, so let's work so the point of view we take here is that we're, get, we're gonna think about doing a priori estimates. So suppose you have a smooth solution. Ah, I changed from U to V, but it should be U. So. Probably can't tell the difference between my U and my V anyway. Okay, so suppose we have a smooth solution and let's do this from start. All right, so we have one unit tangent vector field, and then we can get a second one, which is orthogonal, just by doing the 90 degree rotation. So then E and JE are an orthonormal frame, they're in particular an orthonormal basis on each tangent space. And then we're going to take derivatives of the equation. Well, there's really only one that we need to take, and that's the radial derivative, and express it in this frame. So let's express u sub r, which remember is a tangent vector. in this frame. So uh, that's in this frame. So we can write it this way. Let's make a complex function 
two by taking the dot product like this. So that's a complex value function. Is the coordinates of the derivative of u in the orthonormal frame. Good. Now let's use the equation. This equation, so let's call this SM rad, radial Schrodinger map. Let's use this equation to find an equation for this now usual complex function Q. Here's the equation. I'll write it again. Let's apply to both sides covariant, uh, covariant the radial derivative. Here's another very small exercise. First, covariant derivatives commute with usual derivatives. Second, rotation commutes with covariant derivative. Maybe a third one coming soon, so I'll leave some space. Okay, so I can use those facts. Reverse the differentiation here. And now the way I'm going to write this combination of dr and dr plus 1 over r is to recognize that this operator is actually the adjoint of this one because we're working in two space dimensions with radial symmetry. So when I do integration by parts with dr because of the r dr, I pick up one over r. So this up to a minus sign is the adjoint of this. So I can write, in fact, this. This is a very simple version of something we see again and again when we work with these geometric equations. There's a lot of structure here. And in particular, we always, we always have these factorizations. The operators are always factoring into adjoint and operator and its adjoint. This is sometimes called uh, supersymmetry. Or this form of operator is sometimes called supersymmetry. But anyway, it's a very useful thing which comes up in these geometric problems a lot. Okay, so I need to turn this into an equation for the coordinates, Q, which means I have to understand how to differentiate U sub R. Well, uh, when I differentiate U sub R, uh, derivatives will land on the Q, but they'll also land on the orthonormal frame. So I need to know how to differentiate uh, say dr of the frame. So what happens? This is a unit vector, always a unit vector. And so its derivative has to be orthogonal to the vector itself. But this is also a covariant derivative, so it's a tangent vector. So it also has to be orthogonal to u, has to be in the tangent direction. So the only possibility is that this is some multiple of rotated u. So this is some function, let's call it t. E. So this is really just the definition of the function u t. And same with the time derivative. Like this.
I know how to do these derivatives. So dt on ur, in terms of its coordinates, coordinates are q. I'll get the derivative of q, and then I'll get plus t. But since this is rotated, I'll get an, an i. So it's easy to check. This expression for the coordinate function from this equation. Uh, sorry, J. J. The name of the game is to analyze this equation instead of the original one, which is an equation for a usual complex function, q, and it's starting to look like a Schrodinger equation. Since I have this term, if I put the i over here, I have i dt, and over here I have something like Laplace. So it's starting to resemble a Schrodinger equation. The next thing to do is to use so-called gauge freedom. So so far, I just said take any, take any tangent vector field and go from there. But of course, you have many choices of tangent vector field. And so you should choose one, which makes the equations look good. This is called gauge freedom. And so let's make such a choice. Let's choose to remove this function t. I.e., this equation here. This is sometimes called, the, well, this is a gauge choice, and in particular, this one is sometimes called Coulomb gauge. you can do that, and of course you have to check that you can. Then you can rewrite this equation in a nice way. Uh, let's multiply through by i. And we get this equation. So this is, this is now a Schrodinger equation. Here's the usual thing. This is basically Laplacian, although the factors are reversed, so it's not quite Laplacian. And this is some potential, and we have to figure out what this potential is. So the last step is to figure out the potential, S. One, two, three. This is step four. Step five. And this is where the so-called curvature relation comes in. Okay, so let's see. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna compute the commutation of these two covariant derivatives, so that's curvature, acting on E. According to my gauge choice, when the dr hits the E, I get zero, so I have only the dt here. So this is the same as dr dt E. Because of this expression, I can replace DTE by S A E so on the left. I have this guy. Again, using the, this uh, parallel transport condition, Coulomb gauge. 
On the other hand, I have the curvature relation, which you can easily work out. This is this is part three of the exercise. So I guess I better do less. Let's see, what will we get? We will get dt dot e r minus derivatives yep. and then you can work out what this is in coordinates it turns out to be exactly This is also part of the exercise. All right, so now we have an expression that relates this potential S with Q itself. We have this R equals this quantity. Is uh, I guess it's like this. And you can also rewrite this as this. And we can integrate to get S. Put that back in my equation. Oh, this looks very, very much like a nonlinear Schrodinger equation, familiar nonlinear Schrodinger equation. In fact, cubic nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So this is basically Laplacian. You, uh, you manipulate this, you can get rid of this guy. It really is Laplacian. So this is the linear Schrodinger equation. This term here is the usual focusing cubic nonlinearity. And the, the strange thing is this non-local. Let's call this non-local NLS. And the point is to, instead of analyzing this, try to analyze this equation directly, we look at this one. We can think of this as an initial value problem. Q is a coordinate representation of the derivative of V. So Q now is an L2 function. So this is, if you like, this is a so-called mass critical This is cubic in two dimensions, it's mass critical. But non local. Okay. 
So that trick that I just went through, this uh, coordinate frame business, turning this geometric equation into a more familiar equation for an honest to goodness complex dot replace. This is uh, something I learned from the paper of uh, Chang, Shaka, and Ian Beck. They called it, they gave it a name, they call it generalized Hashimoto transform. And the reason they call it this is because apparently there is some more or less classical transformation due to Hashimoto for the one dimensional problem. So the one-dimensional Schrodinger map problem uh, can be converted by a, a version of this same uh, operation into honest-to-goodness cubic NLS. So without, without a funny term, real cubic NLS, but cubic one-dimensional NLS, in particular, a completely integrable system. So this is something from the integrable system literature, generalized to this problem. But really, this is a simple case of what is always done when analyzing these geometric PDEs, because you have to express the map by taking its derivatives and expressing the derivatives in orthonormal frames in order to work in the usual function space. So this is a simple case of that. Okay. So, now uh, there's something, of course, that I am brushing under the rug that I'm ignoring. I, I showed you how to go one way, so to go from the Schrodinger map equation to this NLS type equation. I didn't show you how to go back. This is somehow more difficult, but uh, turns out that if you have a sufficient regularity, you can also go back and create a Schrodinger map from a solution of this equation. Or if you prefer, and in fact, this is, this is what we do, if you prefer, you can uh, just think of this equation as a method for getting a priori estimates on this guy. So you have some kind of local well posedness theory for this one. Given this solution, you can construct this one. You can do estimates over here, and then contradict possible blow-ups over here using this. So either way, it suffices to prove global well-posedness for this equation. So that's the that's really the theorem. Is that we have global well-posedness. Scattering for this non local NLS. Okay, so there's just time to say quick words about the proof. Okay, so by now it's, it's well understood in the literature how you try to prove uh, global well posedness and scattering results for critical equations. There's machinery that's been developed due to many people, including uh, principally Haig and Merrill. So the idea is to use the Koenig Merrill type. reduction to a minimal, say a minimal non-scattering solution, minimal mass to be precise, or minimal L2 norm, 
on scattering solution. So you suppose you want to prove that all solutions are global and scatter. You assume that's false. Argue by contradiction. Find the smallest L2 mass for which the statement fails. And construct using uh, concentration compactness techniques a non-scattering solution at that critical mass level. Uh, but more precisely, we use the kennick merrill reduction as, as done by Philip Tao and V. Zhang. So as in Philip Tao V. Zhang of uh, what? Nine. Philip Tao and Vizan considered this equation without the without the non-local term, and either either you have to change the sign of the local term to make it a defocusing, or else you allow it to be focusing, and you work uh, only for L two norm below the soliton. Because in that case, if I just remove this, I have solitons. Okay. But if I were to change the sign here, I have no soliton. You can get scattering. Okay, so this is for this is for the local version of that equation. So what does the reduction uh, to uh, minimal mass non-scattering solution do? It generates a, a, a critical solution, a threshold solution. with some properties, special properties. Uh, first is a compactness property. Compactness up to scaling. So something like this. This family up to some scaling time time dependent scaling function is compact or more precisely pre compact in l2 so if you take sequences of these guys you have converging subsequence l2 so this is certainly not a property of general solutions this is a property of this minimal non scattering solution Moreover, there were refinements, refinements of Kilip Tao and, and Vizan uh, to show that Q is somehow regular. In other words, smoother than just L, L2. So a priori, it's just L2. But this minimal solution has extra regularity. In fact, it's in any Sobolev space you want. Finally, they reduce matters to three possible behaviors of this time dependent scaling function. So you can consider, it's enough to consider one of these. One in the middle there, the so-called self-similar one. That's that's not a global solution. This is a global solution. This is a global solution. This one is not. This has blow off at time zero. Okay. So once you have this, this is after the concentration compactness and harmonic analysis aspects, what do you do? Well, if you are Philip Tao and the Vizan and you have just usual cubic Schrodinger, you say, well, this solution is 
more regular than L2. In particular, the energy. There's an energy which is well defined for the local Schrodinger equation. And I can use that energy to rule out certain behaviors. Any kind of blow up, for example. Let's say we're in the depot potential. Any kind of blow up or, or so. So, so from their point of view, once the solution is regular, you can use the higher order conservation law, the energy, to understand what's going on. For us, we don't have the energy because we already we had an energy, but we took a derivative, so the energy became the L2 norm, and we don't know anything higher. So we need something to replace the energy. And so we need to use some kind of so-called virial type identity. Here's a, an exercise. So formally, what do I mean by formally? I mean, suppose you have a solution of this equation, which is very well behaved, smooth as you like, and with very good decay at spatial infinity. Then I claim the following identities hold. Here is one. The key observation with these identities is that the right-hand sides of both have a sum. So what that tells you, very roughly speaking, is that this term is beeping this term. This is a focusing term. If I just had this, I would not have this identity. This non-local term is actually beating the local term and allowing you to have these uh, virial type identities with a multiple sign. Without going into any detail, because there's, there's no time, I can use these identities, or more precisely, I have, to, I have to use cutoff versions of these identities. So here on this one, I have to uh, cut off spatial infinity. I have to stop somewhere, put some smooth cutoff point. Here I have to cut off the origin. But I can use these cutoff versions of these identities and use the compactness to control the error term on the cutoff to eliminate each of these two possible behaviors by comparing the left-hand side to the right-hand side of this identity and this identity. This one is for these cases. Uh, yeah. And this one. For this one. And thus, I, 
can use the the shell. That's the only solution with this property that you're applying. Okay, so I think you've earned a break. <laughs> <laughs>